Good morning, everybody, especially our friends who are joining us virtually. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for coming. I'm Jano Lieber, and I'm joined by our chief customer officer, Sarah Meyer, who does such a great job pushing for the interests of our customer, which is really what we're all about at the MTA right now. We're here to talk about something that everyone's been talking about already for a couple of weeks now, which is the MTA's package of exciting new fair promotions. The ads are already going up in the system. You're going to start to see them um, before the promotions, these discounts, take effect at the end of this month. But we wanted people to know that they're coming so that they can take advantage of them. I've made it a priority to get creative unfairs since we stepped into this role. People constantly ask me about whether we should be raising the fare, and we had a scheduled fare increase. I said no. At this moment, when you're down riders, and right now we're at roughly three million riders on a weekday, so on the subway, compared to five and a half million before COVID, it's not time to raise the price. That's just basic business logic. And if we're gonna continue rebuilding ridership, and the numbers are coming up, they're really bouncing back since Omicron has started to recede. Um, we need to make mass transit as attractive as possible in every way. And a big part of that is giving our customers the best deal. So thanks to the, the generous decision that Governor Hochul made and was reflected in her executive budget, um, we're be, we've been able to put off the fare increase that was scheduled for 2021, even for the entire, not just for 2021, but for all of 2022. But we're trying to go beyond just freezing fares. We're trying a new slate of temporary promotions, which are strategically designed to do something for everyone and to really attract riders back. Subway and bus customers using Omni are for the first time gonna be able to take advantage of fare capping, eliminating the question of whether to pre-purchase an unlimited fare or a weekly fare, or, 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 an unlimited uh, weekly pay per ride. That's really important because a lot of New Yorkers struggle with the question of how many rides am I going to take in this coming week? Is it a good idea to buy the, the weekly now? We want to make it easy and we're taking advantage of the Omni system to make it so that automatically you just tap and go and after 12 rides, as we say, 13 is your lucky number. Everything past 12 rides in a week, starting on Monday, is going to be free. On the commuter railroads, we're doing a new 20 trip option and that's designed to appeal to the new hybrid customer, the rider who maybe was a monthly customer, a monthly ticket purchaser before, but maybe riding less frequently as she or he has a two or three day a week um, office schedule. Um, and monthly ticket holders who are historically the best customers for the commuter railroads, for the Long Island Railroad and Metro North, will see a 10% reduction in the normal fees for a monthly uh, peak fare. And to encourage railroad travel, this is important, Within New York City, the railroads, the Long Island Railroad and the Metro North have a lot of stops that are within New York City, but it hasn't been used so much, those railroads haven't been used so much by New Yorkers to get to different parts of the city. So we're having, instituting a $5 flat fare for all off-peak trains on the commuter railroads from one point within the city to another point within the city. That means uh, somebody who's the parent of small kids living in Southeast Queens can, can take the railroad to Penn Station as well as to Atlantic now off peak for that incredibly discounted $5 flat fare. And those, those discounts are now all off peak times, not just on the weekends. Beyond these promotions, we've also made it easier than ever to apply for a reduced fair metro card by introducing online applications. This is really important. We want every senior, every person with disabilities who's eligible for reduced fare to have that permanently, not to have to 
go through the process every time they want to take a ride. And we're working also, this is a huge priority of mine. You know, a great program, the city instituted a few years ago, but it's only reaching a small percentage of the people who are eligible, only 200 and something thousand people after like 700, out of 750,000 people whose income would qualify them for this incredibly advantageous half price Metro card program. So we are working with the city to grow enrollment so that everybody who needs that extra help benefits. Transit affordability is an equity issue. It's a, it's a fairness issue and I have made it a priority and we're gonna do everything we can to achieve that goal while we're also working to bring the MTA back to financial health and the discounts that we're instituting today and reestablishing MTA's financial stability are not contradictory goals because we think we're gonna bring a lot of riders back to the system, encourage more people to use the system. So that's our, that, those are our twin goals, equity and financial stability for the MTA and the programs we're announcing and emphasizing today are really serving those twin goals. So with that, let me turn it over to my partner, my friend, the inimitable Sarah Meyer. Thanks, Jano. I'm so excited to officially unveil our campaign for new fare discounts. Fares that are more affordable, more flexible, more fair. You can see examples of the new ad campaigns for the fair promotions on the screens right in front of us. Really, really want to thank um, my partners, Joe Chan and Eugene Ribeiro, who lead design and production. Um, really incredible work. These are not the easiest fair promotions to explain. So really excited that we've been able to use uh, real language, New Yorker language, a lot of emojis, um, and um, really happy to be translating these ads as well. So we make sure that we reach every New Yorker and every tourist. The monthly ticket, the 20 trip ticket, and the expanded city ticket will go on sale on the 25th while Omni Fair Capping, which starts on Mondays, will begin February 28th. The discounts will last at least four months, and this is where we need you, New York. If you buy and purchase these tickets and uh, engage in fair capping, this is how we're gonna expand and continue these discount programs. So really looking for New Yorkers to buy tickets, to use mass transit, to use public transit, get out of the cars, get out of those Ubers, and take public transit. We're also gonna be monitoring the impacts on customer experience, on operations, and of course, on Fairbox, Fairbox revenue. I'm personally really excited about the expansion of City Ticket. And that allows travel within New York City, on Metro North, or Long Island Railroad, for just $5 at off-peak times. So that means if you live near a railroad station and not near a subway station, you can now take, the, take a commuter train from Marble Hill to Grand Central, from Woodlawn to Grand Central. And these trains are faster. Less stops, faster. You can save 20 minutes, 30 minutes off of your commute, um, especially on the Long Island Railroad. So you can take the train from Hollis, from Rosedale, Locust Valley, Bayside, right into Penn Station at off-peak times. Really, really excited. Also wanted to give some more context on fare capping, since this is new for all of us. Riders tapping into the system with Omni would be charged the standard $2.75 rate for their first 12 trips. And that starts every Monday. And then, after the 12 trips, Every trip will be free. So that means that weekly riders, that riders that, that use the system more than 12 times in one week, will only pay $33. No longer, you don't have to pay up front for that ticket. You can pay $275 at a time, and in these times when you're not really sure if you're going to work, or if you're the essential worker that needs to go into work every day, 
use Omni. It's the way to get the cheapest rate for the subway. We're also gonna be able to keep right, all those free transfers from the subway to the bus with Omni. So don't, I know I'm getting a lot of questions about that. Our system, our backend system knows if you're traveling within that two hour period, you're not gonna be charged twice. You're only gonna be charged once if you engage in the transfer system. We're really thrilled to be leveraging Omni in this way. We've been waiting for this kind of flexibility for a long time now, and it's finally becoming a reality. As for next steps with Omni, our team is laser focused on getting more cards into retailers. We're also um, building out those uh, vending machines. So our team just left uh, Cubix Lab where those vending machines are being built. They saw the actual machinery, they're making sure everything looks right and it can stand up to the rigors of the New York City system and everything looks good. So we're really excited to get those machines into the system this year. So um, really stay tuned, a lot more coming on the Omni front over the next couple months. And I'll throw it back to Jano for the start of our Q&A. All right, anybody have questions? On, why don't we do on topic first? On topic. It's my, what kind of difference do you think it'll make to get people back, number one, and number two, how much in drawing people back is about fair, excuse me, about fares, and how much is about safety? It, 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 it's a fair question um, that we are, look, our job is to, is to focus on transportation, the variables that we control, which are, you know, reliability of the system, the speed of the system, and the fares. And I think we're actually doing a good job of bringing people back using those tools. Safety is an issue where we are relying on other parts of government. We're relying on mostly on the NYPD and the DAs to help us create a really safe environment. Fortunately, we have a mayor who's really prioritized safety in the subways. And we, so we're optimistic about that, but that is a variable. But our job is to deliver safe, I mean, to deliver reliable, speedy service and to give really attractive you know, uh, fares, a, a really attractive deal to our riders, and you can see us doing that today. As for the question of how quick, what impact it'll have, look, we, the reason that we're doing this as a pilot is, part of this is we're trying to find out, but I'll tell you this, Atlantic Ticket, which was the first major pilot along the lines of what we're doing with, with the City Ticket program, was successful in getting people to ride in seats that were otherwise going empty and actually increase the MTA's revenue by a million dollars, uh, a, a million dollars, I think a million dollars a week or a million dollars a month. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I should know that, but I'm gonna have to come back to the exact. But there's a significant increase in revenue and ridership on the Atlantic branch attributable to the Atlantic ticket program. Now we're broadening it and everybody um, who's getting familiar with with Omni is excited about this program where you don't have to worry about you know, buying a, a, an unlimited in advance, but it does it automatically. So I'm, I'm optimistic. Yeah. The fares enough. Is that, is that enough to bring people back? Well, all I can tell you is we were at, you know, let's look at the history of where we were before Omicron. We were at 3.4 million subway riders a day. We were at 60% of pre-COVID ridership. That's a weekday number. We dropped down a little bit by Omicron, down to just barely over two million riders a day. So a significant drop. And here we are today, um, at the end of last week, we were pushing three million riders a day. So we've come flying back from the Omicron surge. And I, I you know, I, listen, none of us has a crystal ball, but the indications are New Yorkers are ready to ride. The principal demonstration of that is the level of ridership in the off-peak times, in times which are truly discretionary, no one's calling people to work, those have always been pretty high. And this weekend, I was on the trains in the evenings, and boy, it was rocking. So I'm optimistic. New Yorkers are coming out of Omicron, they're coming back to transit, and now they're gonna have the benefit of these really attractive promotions. All right, on topic, yeah, 
Jano, can you uh, explain what went into the decision to make this a Monday to Friday or mon seven day calendar week promotion instead of on a rolling basis? Do you guys have the technology to do it on a rolling basis or what was the difference? I I'm going to have to get back to you on the specifics. I think the percent right now we're in the process of we're still in the process of developing Omni. It's no secret. What we're trying to do is to roll it out as quickly as possible so people start to get the benefit of it. And I believe that 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 Monday to Friday uh, Monday to, through Sunday setup was a function of where we are technologically, um, but I'll, I'll, we will get you a clarification on that. Thank you. Go ahead, please, Sarah. So the other thing, right, as, as you heard, this is a complicated um, topic for us all to, to grasp, um, and just having that finite starts on Monday, ends on Sunday, allows us to better communicate the benefits, and, you know, I don't remember personally how many trips I take, right? How do we really remember? How do we not create distrust in the system where somebody might think that they might have traveled three times on Monday and four times on Tuesday? It's very difficult to say, okay, I want fare capping to start Tuesday. It would start a lot of confusion and people would start worrying again. What we want to do is take the worry out of the system, out of the process, Again, you just tap your fares away as, as the campaign promises, right? The whole um, reason we're starting this way is so that we can better communicate what fare capping is. We do have the technology to roll it out to be any day. We might consider that in another, at another time. A, a better answer than mine, Clayton. First, you've is said that is that hat from Nice in France? Because if not, it's not a violation of truth in advertising. Uh, yeah, Happy New Year, Jano. Merry yeah. Christmas. Um, what 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 New Year? Yeah, are we talking about? Um, you've said temporary and pilot. I'm wondering yeah. if if this is successful, will it become permanent? Is that the goal here? I, I, I we're very much hoping that this is successful. The, the the reason that we're doing it as a pilot, to be honest, is. One, we're, try we're still learning a lot about how people are using, especially the commuter railroads within the city and what, you know, and what will alter that behavior and get people to take advantage. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we have, if we, if we go to permanent fare changes, it's a very long process. We wanted to start these right as soon as we could so that the process of attracting people back to transit and giving them the best deal could be as quickly as possible. But we're going to be evaluating this quickly and hopefully um, continuing. I, I personally hope that we're going to be continuing uh, these. We'll see what happens. Dave, come on, back there. Uh, obviously, riders, uh, ridership returning uh, increasing has a lot of variables going into it. So what are the metrics for success for this pilot beyond whether or not it increases ridership? Um, what are, you, what are you looking for? You want to, Sarah, I would invite you to take a crack at that. We're looking for ridership. That's the whole point of these promotions, why they were designed. Um, that's the primary metric for success. Um, there's a couple other added aspects around on the railroads, um, how quickly tickets can be collected, how quickly digital technology is adopted. Um, so we're just testing some things around operations. There might be some things we, we might look at changing moving forward. There might be things we might keep the same, but that's part of the reason that we're doing this as a pilot and what we're doing um, to make sure that uh, these are designed to bring ridership back. If they're not, we're going to look at it again and, and do more. Right, so if ridership stays flat, is that failure? Or is that we have to tweak this or is it walking away from it? I'm going to tweak I, it. But, okay. Listen, I think it, it, what we're trying to do, first of all, obviously, as I said before, is give people the benefit of Omni as quickly as possible, although the completion of the Omni system is, is still, you know, a year away, right? And when we transition fully to Omni from MetroCard, it's still a ways away, but we want to give people benefits as quickly as possible. So that is a variable other than ridership. We want to support the goal of transit equity. And that means getting people who live in New York, who live in neighborhoods that have commuter rail stations, but who may not be using those commuter rail stations that would get them to where they're going much more quickly, that they have an incentive to do it. And we're doing it in a way that is guaranteed not to, uh, not to stress capacity by, by doing it as we are rolling it out as, 
everywhere, but in the all in the off-peak, right? So there are other goals that are being served by this, but obviously bringing people back to mass transit, which supports our equity goals, it also supports our collective interest in a stronger, revived New York economy. It supports our, our climate change goals of getting people always to use mass transit. It will ease the transition to congestion pricing. All of those goals are being served by giving riders the best possible deal on mass transit, apart from increases to ridership. Right, Steve. Uh, on topic, Steve? Steve. Go ahead. Of course, on topic. Um, just a quick question. Sarah mentioned something about this is how we expand. What do you, it, what, I know you were talking about like the success threshold, but does that mean if it's a hit, next stop is the 30 day unlimited? Like, what do you mean by this is how we expand? And a second question, totally unrelated, but are you guys retrofitting the existing MetroCard machines or are you putting in all new MetroCard Omni vending machines? So I think, right, we have lots of fair products that are in existence, and we want to be able to uh, utilize them to grow our ridership. So yes, the hope is that we will expand this. That being said, as Jano mentioned, uh, we need to make sure that we are also pursuing MTA's financial stability. So lots of things to weigh, and um, just really excited about today and about launching fair capping. Um, it's, it's a really big day. Um, and the other question was, was vending machines. They're new. They're all new, and um, we're looking forward to them coming in. And, and Steve, just a little, a, a, a little fun fact is that the, the vending machine was tested. The vending machine was tested, I think, in Tennessee at a, at a, a factory test in the last week. And it was, and the test went well. So again, that's part of moving Omni into full operation. Again, that's part of moving Omni into full operation and, and hitting the goals of that project. So uh, another positive milestone for the Omni program. All right, uh, one more. You have a, a gentleman right there who wants to go, but go ahead. Right. Kevin, we'll come to the gentleman moment. All right, I'll try and uh, put my is there. I don't know if you can hear me. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask about uh, the city ticket. Um, you know, previously we had the Atlantic ticket, which was both on and off peak. What's happening with that now? Will it only be off peak from now on? No, the city, the Atlantic ticket is continuing as it is. Um, it is a little different, uh, and it, it's one of the reasons it's challenging to explain, but. Yeah, it's a little bit different, but we're continuing Atlantic ticket as is. <clears throat> Sorry, and you mentioned fair fares. Uh, you know, there's been a push, uh, I know we have some MTA board members to put it down to the city's poverty line as opposed to the federal one, which is a little bit uh, higher. The city's, and is that something you agree with? Is that something you think the city should be doing? I, I think in the end, the city has to look at that from the standpoint of their own, go you know, their own goals in terms of how they spend money um, on different causes, but from, the MTA standpoint, that is a, you know, something that makes sense to consider. If the goal is to make sure that people who really are, you know, justifiably considered low income have the benefit of this reduced fare program, then we probably, it does make sense to consider using uh, a, a standard for that enrollment that isn't just the federal poverty standard, which is obviously inconsistent with New York's um, cost of living realities. So we've got, you know, other, other programs use Medicaid. Medicaid is a higher standard in New York to qualify. There's a New York State poverty standard. I don't know if I'm saying that quite right, right but they define it differently than the feds. So uh, I do think that that is worth considering. But the first step, Kevin, would be for the, the city to put back the money that was taken out of fair fares, I believe, during the course of, of the pandemic. It doesn't, didn't make sense, and this was in the de Blasio era, that when, uh, at the moment when essential workers, which are overwhelmingly people at the low end of our economic spectrum, for better or worse, that's the reality, at the moment that those people were heroically continuing to use mass transit, the city cut investment in the fair fares program. And that doesn't make sense, and we hope and expect that that will be reversed 
and as you said, additional people will be made eligible for this important uh, equity initiative. So just to clarify about that point, uh, they did restore it somewhat, but not all the way to the full amount yeah. it was previously. Is that what you're asking for? I, I am, I am. I think that, you know, at minimum, especially since we're, we're all thinking that enrollment should be pushed upwards, and our board member, David Jones, has been such a consistent and powerful voice on this, we should push enrollment up a lot, and that means at least to have all of the money that the city put into this before the pandemic restored. Kevin, as you know, it's now about half of what it was before the pandemic. Did we have somebody back there? Yes. On top? I had a question. On top? On top? Yes. No. For the commuters in the, uh, along the Port Jervis line, will they be involved in the Omni program? The, yes. The, number one, the commuters on, on the Port Jervis line are going to benefit from, right now, a reduced cost of the monthly tickets for starters. For those people who are monthly commuters, we're knocking down the normal peak monthly uh, by 10%. Yes, the Omni program is going to extend to the commuter railroads. It's going to take a year or so longer than the, met, you know, the, the city metro card system. But yes, the commuter railroads are going to be part of the Omni. We will have one fair payment system and it's coming for west of Hudson as well as the rest of the Metro North system. How will that work with the uh, New Jersey transit system? I'm sorry? How will that mesh with the New Jersey transit system? Because right, um, now, right now they buy their tickets through New Jersey transit. Uh, I'm gonna ask uh, Sarah to comment on that, but let me just clarify one other thing is right now, with this fair promotion package that we're rolling out today, a Metro North commuter, including those on the Port Jervis line, also has the benefit of this very discounted 20 trip ticket which um, acknowledges that some people may be moving off of monthlies because of hybrid work and we're trying to bring them back and we're giving them a better deal than they would otherwise have so that's a benefit today sarah do you want to comment on how the fair payment system will work in the end yeah we're really looking forward to a fully integrated omni system across the mta so one account um, one login, one dashboard that shows you all of your transactions um, and you can seamlessly transfer from the Long Island Railroad or Metro North to the subway, uh, express buses to the subway, et cetera, um, and excited to roll out um, you know, with that integration uh, the potential for, for additional discounts. Anybody have an off topic now? We'll do a couple off topic. Dave Salone right there. Uh, so, John, I've asked you about this a lot of times, uh, state funding, uh, requests for funding. I know you've said before you're agnostic about where money comes from, uh, but there's a proposal out there to uh, invert the way, the ratio that the gas taxes are collected and uh, given out in the metro and the MTA area. So instead of getting one-third of the gas taxes uh, in that area, the MTA would get two-thirds. People say it could raise $500 billion uh, a year for the MTA. Should the governor be uh, embracing this idea and uh, making it happen in her budget? So, Dave, I think you, you actually perfectly characterized the MTA's position. We're agnostic on how exactly the governor and the legislature choose to give us additional money. But we are asking for, oh, in the next couple of years, for there be additional recurring resources given to the MTA to make sure that we can close that structural, multi-billion dollar structural budget gap, okay? So we're saying this consistently, I'm saying it years in, in advance of when it hits, because the decisions about which different taxes or which different sources should be utilized is really for the governor and the legislature to decide. But I'll say this, that the legislators and other people who are putting those ideas on the table are doing us all a, a, you know, a service because what they're doing is getting everybody to focus on early the fact that this is a real issue and it needs to be addressed. And, and they're starting a discussion that I have been urging the legislature to have. And so I, without taking a position on a specific tax adjustment, I say bless those legislative leaders who are raising the issue and coming up with ideas and starting the discussion. Jano, I want to see if you had a comment on the bus that got hit by a bullet last night at Lexington, or yesterday afternoon at Lexington in 125th, amid a shootout. Look, I mean, listen, we've got, there is a, 
a, a violence problem in our city and especially a gun violence problem in our city. Fortunately, the mayor, the new mayor, and his administration have uh, made this a priority. And I've had several meetings now with the new administration, including with, um, I've talked about it with the mayor, I've spent some time with Deputy Mayor Phil Banks, I've talked to the police commissioner at some length, and as you saw at our board meeting, we've had a lot of discussions with the new Transit Bureau Chief, Jason Wilcox. So they are working hard to bring gun violence under control. There's obviously federal issues and out of state issues that they have, that are having a role in this, how easy it is to buy guns and bring them to New York. But our focus is on the subway and on the buses and our, our commuters. And it, you know, our, in terms of uh, security, our focus is on some of the unique circumstances that are creating safety problems in our system. This weekend, we had bicycle on tracks. Some person, I think they're an so-called EDP, person with mental health issues, threw a bicycle on the tracks. Fortunately, the train stopped and didn't. there wasn't an explosion like there had been in prior cases with the steel on electricity issues. But um, we had a shopping cart on the tracks. We had somebody in the tunnels that had to be chased down and apprehended while, while transit riders sat in a tunnel. So we have unique issues in our subway system and in our bus system that we are asking the state authorities and especially the city authorities to address and for you know the first time in a, in a serious way in my view in some time we're getting a positive response and a lot of cooperation so I am optimistic. Anything else on that? Like, is it, Dave, do you have something else? Anybody else? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's Steve. David Meyer, over here and then we'll go to you Steve, alright? Jano, I know this is an ESD, uh, oh well, Jano, I know this is an ESD question but uh, Last week, the land, city landmarks, sorry, well, wow, last week, the city planning commission uh, put out a sort of somewhat supportive, somewhat critical statement on yeah. the Penn State plan. Um, I'm wondering if you could respond to that uh, since you've also been involved in that plan. Specifically, I'm wondering why the commercial development is so important to getting the project done at the station in the state's view. Look, I mean, I think that what you're hearing from a lot of people is that it makes sense for financial reasons to capture some of the value you know again I'm not taking right now I'm not speaking for the specific proposal that ESD has on the table but so you understand the context what happened in the second Avenue subway was there was billions of dollars spent to build that incredible new transportation facility and all of the value of the real estate around it went to people who already owned that property, who didn't contribute to it, to the building of the, the, the public paid for it, but the, all the value went to adjacent property owners, right? And what good business logic and frankly good government increasingly is uh, dictating is that there be some strategy for capturing value. So uh, that you make sure that the government can get some of that value and use it to build the infrastructure. So that is part of what is motivating, I understand, the ESD vision. That's number one. Number two is what that vision, again, which is still very much a work in progress through the city and state land use process, delivers, is a lot of new entrances for Penn Station. We all know, and every one of those buildings that's being targeted or those sites that's being targeted for potential upzoning or new development in the future, irrespective of what it contributes financially to the building of the station or the rehabilitation of the station, will contribute a really important new access to Penn Station, which is a huge problem. Grand Central, we all know, is partly a great facility because you can go north, south, east, west. It's really porous. It's really strategically uh, located for people to get where they're going as they come out of the station. Not so Penn, which feels like a funnel, which doesn't have enough egress, from my standpoint, is not ideal from a safety standpoint, with, with ingress, I mean, uh, exiting and, 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 and egress being so limited. 
Having new entrances would be a huge plus for the riders, for safety, and for the general neighborhood. So there are benefits from a transportation standpoint and from a good policy standpoint to having you know, a redevelopment plan along the lines of what the state and ESD have proposed. We're watching it unfold. Final point. In the meantime, we're focused on getting ready to, to rehabilitate existing Penn. Governor Hochul has said, listen, all this talk about you know, New York is going to contribute to Gateway. All this talk about expanding into you know, a new area of Penn Station, getting more tracks and platforms, it will all benefit trans-Hudson traffic. It will all benefit New Jersey Transit and Amtrak. Good for the region, but for New Yorkers, we got to fix the hellhole that is existing Penn Station. She's made that a priority, and that's my priority in planning for that. All right, Steve Nesson to take us home here. Hello, hello. Hey, Jano. Um, going back to subway safety, you know, anecdotally, I was at the platform where Alyssa Go was killed, Michelle Alyssa Go, and there was a man sitting there smoking a cigarette, screaming at people. Two NYPD officers walk by, they wave at him, he's he waves, he stops screaming, they move on, he goes back to smoking. I asked them, you know, are there increased patrols here like we were hearing about? They shake their head and said no. So I know you said twice that Eric Adams prioritized safety in the subways. Can you tell us some concrete examples of how they've done that other than talking about it? Okay, so what I've seen, Steve, uh, and, and again, uh, you know, what you describe is a disturbing story of what I think Eric Adams doesn't want what the rest of his administration doesn't want, what I know the new police commissioner doesn't want, I know Jason Wilcox doesn't want, which is, you know, same as, you know, same old, same old, right? Um, what, what I think uh, is, ha what I've seen so far, and it's my personal observation, is a lot more cops on platforms around the system, uh, and I've seen a lot more cops on trains. Um, it's still a work in progress, I think the deployments are being adjusted. We spoke to Chief Wilcox literally in the last week, and he is ramping up that whole system. But think of what he said, and you know, I believe they're going to make good on it. One, that he's going to make a foundation of transit patrol platforms, cops on platforms, cops on trains. That is a change from the old system. The, second, the other thing is that, that the above grade patrols, that's regular street patrols in cars and otherwise, are going to come down and work the MTA system to make sure it's safe. So those are meaningful commitments. I've seen them being implemented, but it's not a finished product, and we're, we're, we're going to continue in dialogue with them. What I'm asking for, and I think that we're going to have the city's cooperation, is that there be a commitment to enforce the subway rules of conduct. And again, this is not directed at um, any individual. It's not meant to, you know, single out anybody. But what you describe, which is, you know, smoking, you know, even all the behaviors that just make it hard for regular riders to use the system that are prohibited. We're, we prohibit them and we're allowed to. It's been litigated that we should start to enforce that in the interest of the everyday rider being feeling more safe being more safe and frankly getting to use the system rather than being pushed away from an area which seems uncomfortable. That has to start in my view with these shopping carts because that is a danger. So we had last week we had a shopping cart set on fire in a car. We had shopping carts in we've had episodes where shop, you know it's hard to even talk about. Garrett Gobel, a train operator died a, you know, almost two years ago now because a shopping cart was set on fire. So getting the shopping carts out, which are a risk to our workforce and, and, and to our riders, is a good place to start. But generally, I think there's a commitment to enforce the subway rules of conduct. That's going to be the basis of turning things around. Thank you for the question. Thank you. I, you know, I, I, I think in, in fairness, I, I'm not setting deadlines from them, but I am meeting with them to, you know, remember this is a partnership. We have to talk about where are the deployments, which trains, 
and so on. And those discussions are happening. In the meantime, I, am, I'm, I, I insist that there is visibly more police presence on the platforms on the, uh, and on the trains than there used to be, and that's a good sign. Thank you. Thanks okay. very much. All right. Thank you, everybody.